Croeso Iedris Cadero to there. We welcome to St. David's Cathedral, one of the major sites of early Christianity in these islands. So called St. David's, David's house in Welsh, Tidewi, because David, the patron saint of Wales, is thought to have come here sometime in the middle of the 6th century to found a monastery with a few companions, came to a small, sheltered, marshy valley, which in fact gives the uh, Latin name uh, Menivia and the other Latin name Valis Rosina to this site. Here he spent his life and here he died. And on the spot that he died, later on in later centuries, this magnificent stone cathedral was constructed. Now, certainly he wouldn't have known anything like this because whatever he used would have been much slighter, much less monumental. Indeed, either wooden uh, huts, stone huts, or indeed even mud huts, all of which have been swept away by time and indeed by the climate and, of course, by the Vikings because this site was heavily raided in the 9th and the 10th centuries, even into the 11th century, by the sea rovers who in fact killed two of our bishops and certainly caused the site to be deserted uh, for several, several years. And then in the 12th century, this present magnificent stone cathedral was constructed. Now, in fact, it wasn't the first stone cathedral on the site. In 1131, Bernard, our first Norman bishop, put up a cathedral here. That has gone. But we assume it was on the higher and the drier part of this site, which is now underneath the high altar and the presbytery. What they did in 1181, when they uh, began this new work, as they called it, and this, in fact, is what we're in now, the nave of the present cathedral, and this nave indeed gives you an idea of what they'd intended for the whole um, 12th century building, they laid the building out around, we suspect, the previous one to keep that one going as long as possible. Uh, and then they had to cope with a major problem. That is the slope of the sites. And what they did really was to uh, make sure that each of the columns of these splendid arcades was longer than the one to the east of it. The theory being that by the time they got to the, uh, to the tops of the arches, everything would be horizontal. As you see, there are several major problems with that interpretation. The first thing is they had laid the outer walls out first. They had built the west front, which is in front of me. They had built the half arches out from the west front with the intention that they would meet the big semicircular arches of the arcades when those came down. Well, they got the spacing wrong. And in fact, the uh, last pair of arches is neither round nor pointed. And I say that because the main arches of this arcade are these big, heavy, semicircular um, arches, heavily decorated. And then above them in the triforium, uh, well, it would be a triforium in other cathedrals here, it's a light stone screen. And in that screen, there are, in fact, a pairs of small pointed arches. Round arches are Norman or Romanesque, pointed arches are early English or Gothic. But they're the same date here, because what you have is this, we've actually caught a snapshot, as it were, of the change in style from one to the other, hence transitional uh, Norman. Now, of course, it's not the architecture that most people notice when they come into this building. The arcading is certainly not upright. It leans outwards and it leans downwards. And then they also see the magnificent timber ceiling uh, above us, and all of those things are linked. Uh, we now know that, uh, having done borings recently, that the nave of the cathedral is actually on gravel and water. They seem to have built the nave on the old bed of the, the River Allen, which is a very unwise thing to do. And then the um, unsuitable nature of the, of the site, indeed, um, Valis Rosina actually means the Vale of the Little Swamp, and this is exactly what we what we have here, plus the fact that the tower was unstable for most of its life, has actually caused the arcading and the west front to lean outwards at various times. In the 1780s, because we, here we are just in front of the west door, in the 1780s we wouldn't dared have stood here because the front had moved three feet and was shifting out at a quarter of an inch a year. Doesn't sound much, but with 5,000 tons of tower coming this way and all the weights of the arcading, uh, it was a very precarious situation indeed. We called in John Nash, the distinguished London architect, to do the uh, repairs. He, in fact, rebuilt the West Front in a rather nice Strawberry Hill Gothic style. Um, the Victorians didn't like that and um, replaced it with uh, a much more austere uh, style. And we, in fact, have just re refaced that now about um, th three years ago. Um, they didn't actually take it down. They daren't. It would have come down like a set of dominoes. But, of course, it wasn't the first time the problem had happened. 
in the North Isle, we have these huge um, flying buttresses, and these, of course, show that in the 16th century they had the same problem. And at that point, clearly, the roof itself was causing problems. They then lowered the roof structure and filled the, the roof in with this absolutely superb and unique timber ceiling. And we can date it to about 1538, uh, and we know it cost about 400 pounds, which is a colossal sum of money at that, uh, at that time. And in fact, it is not a medieval, but a Renaissance ceiling, because on the pendants, uh, most of them are decorated with S-shapes back to back, which are dolphins, part of the grammar of Renaissance ornament. So the incompetence of the 12th century gave us, in fact, the splendor and the uniqueness of this 16th century ceiling. We've now moved up the nave of the cathedral, and if we pause at this point, it lets us see various of the details which show us really that we're not experiencing this building as our medieval predecessors did between the 12th and the 16th century. Certainly from the 17th to the 19th century, the interior of this building was actually whitewashed every year. Um, so that was one way we are, are, are not seeing this, perhaps as we would have seen it a, a hundred years ago. But even more uh, in, intriguingly, um, the feel of this building is of a very austere building because of this, um, of, of the blue in the, in the stone. But certainly that pier there has got a um, figure, a very shadowy figure of a knight in, in armor on it, which is meant to be King Henry the Fourth. That reminds us that even the dress stonework of this building was actually covered with lime wash, and that lime wash was, was painted. And in fact, um, three or four of these actually survive. So we, we must think of this building as glowing with color. Now secondly, the actual um, stonework of the aisles, which is a rough rubble stonework, that too um, was once covered with render, and you can still see it at the end of the, uh, at the west end indeed of the North Isle, and that render was actually colored cream. Indeed, the building was rendered inside and out, which is an extremely sensible thing to do. The rendering is in fact a lime plaster which helps to protect it and lets the, lets the walls breathe. There's one other major difference between now, as it were, and then. The aisle windows in this cathedral are of clear glass. But that, again, isn't, if you like, isn't authentic in medieval terms. Directly behind me, the window which is just to the uh, east of the north door, the plain glass there has got a, a rim of colored glass actually running around it. That is medieval stained glass, all the medieval stained glass that's left. Because one August afternoon in 1648, a troop of dragoons was sent here uh, in order to get 3,000 pounds of lead off the roof, which they did. Indeed, indeed, they stripped the lead so effectively that over half of this building was open to the skies until about the early decades of the 20th century. But then, being both Puritans and soldiers, they, done, they vandalized the building very effectively. They smashed the windows, they destroyed what was left of the medieval library, they ripped the brasses off the tombs, they took the bells out of the tower, and they demolished the organ. So that really is why, if you like, um, the building is so austere that all the color it had in it was either taken away by um, Puritans in the uh, 17th century or, in fact, whitewashed over by the clergy themselves in the early 17th century. We've now moved up the nave eastwards towards the rood screen or the pulpiton. And we can date this fairly precisely because the tomb uh, space on the right-hand side as I'm looking towards the, uh, towards the screen is that of Henry Gower, Bishop of St. David's, 1328 to 1347. Um, he did, in fact, uh, a great deal to this, to this cathedral. He put the middle stage of the tower in. But on his epitaph, which was taken away by the Puritans when they vandalized the place in the 1640s, um, his epitaph actually said, uh, that he was the constructor of the palace and the magnificent bishop's palace which lies across the uh, Alin from the uh, cathedral, not as some people think the old cathedral, but is in fact 200 years younger than it. He in fact built that magnificent palace, and it is a palace, uh, for himself and for his distinguished guests, i.e. royal pilgrims. I always think when I look at the screen, I'm looking at a gateway. It is like a, if you like, the gateway into heaven um, as it divides the, the nave from the business end of the cathedral where we have the choir and the, and the throne. Now, it again is built of the purple um, Cambodian sandstone, but there are quite strong traces of paint, both on the 
uh, ashlar work and need, there are um, a series of rather fine mural paintings on one of the tomb spaces, uh, the four uh, symbols of the four evangelists and their names, and indeed you also have the reception of a soul into heaven on one side and a um, crucifixion on the other side. But a more interest on the inside of the archway going through the screen, as we look back indeed down from the choir, you can in fact see the famous painting of the owl being mocked by a pair of magpies. Now, of course, people look at the screen and then they look immediately above because today the cathedral organ uh, stands proud on the top of the, of the pulpitum. In the 17th century, um, famous organ builder Bernard Schmidt bit, built an, an organ here. We still have pieces of that case on display in the library. Um, and then in the 1880s, that was replaced by um, Henry, or Father Willis as he's known. And that organ, indeed, in essence, is the one you're looking at now. But in the Middle Ages, of course, the function of the pulpit wasn't just to divide the nave from the presbytery. Uh, it also had on it, because its other name is Rood Screen, it had on it the Rood, R-O-O-D, which is the name for a crucifix. And in our case, I've always suspected that what we had was a, uh, what we had was a large standing Rood, uh, rather than the splendid hanging Rood, which we have put up in the 1930s, now, if you put your eye between the screen and the organ, uh, you will, in fact, see um, a range of woodwork. The lower um, sort of arched and coved and vaulted um, wooden uh, part of the screen, in fact, you might think it was part of the, the um, original rood loft, because these uh, roods actually had lofts in the front of them, where, in fact, the gospel was read during the uh, medieval, medieval services. And that certainly is a piece of medieval woodwork, but in fact it is the top of um, a set of stalls. I do wonder whether those in fact had come from um, St Mary's College when that was dissolved in the 16th century. Then the, the next bit with the little drop moulding is by Butterfield, William Butterfield Workshop in the 1840s, and then above that is um, uh, a parapet put in by Alban Caro in the 19, 1950s. The front of the rood screen um, was redecorated at the beginning of the 20th century. And on the north side, there are three figures, our Lord in the middle, flanked by St. John on the one hand and by St. Paul on the other. They are recognizable by the symbols they hold, John holding a, a chalice and um, Paul holding uh, a sword. And then it's also worth noting the very fine carving of the uh, banding below those, um, those uh, niches, um, especially the splendid figure of a king in the middle of the, uh, under the, under the central figure. But then on the other side is a modern representation, again early 20th century, of David, our patron and founder. But one story um, attached to him is in fact embodied in the statue. Uh, on his right shoulder there is a dove, which is the symbol of the spirit. And it's said that he was called to Tlandewi Brevi, the Church of David, Tlandewi, uh, near, near um, Tregaron in central Cardiganshire, a major David site in the pre-conquest period, uh, called there to address a gathering or um, synod of bishops uh, on the Pelagian heresy. Well, when he got up to speak, nobody could hear him. So a boy puts a handkerchief on the ground, David stands on the handkerchief, the ground rises beneath him, as indeed the modern banner on the pillar next to the screen actually shows. Um, and so eloquent was he that not only did people hear him clearly, but that the Holy Spirit in the form of the dove came and rested on his, on his shoulder. This is where his cult certainly was um, celebrated in the early Middle Ages and the high Middle Ages. People came here in their hundreds and their thousands to worship at his shrine. And it's the offerings, of course, that they brought to this remote spot, the pilgrims, that actually paid for this uh, splendor of wood and stone, which we call St. David's Cathedral. The road screen serves to divide the nave of the cathedral from the presbytery and the choir, which are in effect the business end of the building. And of course, the reason I say that is that here is what actually makes St. David's Cathedral a cathedral. It's not the size of the building, it's not its antiquity, it's not its uh, complexity or sophistication. It is the fact that it has within it the throne, cathedra in Latin and Greek, hence cathedral, the throne of the Bishop of St. David's. And here it is behind me on the uh, south side of the choir, 
Uh, it's a fairly elaborate structure, one seat, in fact, planked, flanked by two seats, one seat for the bishop and two for his, his canons. Uh, recent research has shown, in fact, that it is of the 14th century, and it is indeed the throne constructed by and probably used by and sat in by Henry Gower. A closer look at the throne will show you that certainly parts of it are decorated by painted, uh, or at least the traces now, of painted bishops, painted angels, painted saints. So you have to imagine this uh, splendid structure, uh, glowing with color, with reds and with golds, and really lighting up this, this part of the building. Now, it's not customary for a bishop in the Anglican tradition to run his own cathedral. That is left to a body of clergy called the Dean and Chapter. And the rest of this space is actually occupied by our stalls. Uh, we are, in fact, I suppose, a corporation which runs the cathedral for the bishop. The rest of the time we are here um, saying our prayers in these stalls, because that is what they're for. Um, and I always say that's the most important part of our work here, is simply doing what we have done on this spot for nearly 1,500 years, which is to say or to sing our prayers, morning and evening, day in, day out, Sunday by Sunday. I'm now standing in the canon stalls to give a demonstration of really how they work. There is the seat in its down mode. In other words, they're like tip-up. Um, they are tip-up seats. I need to demonstrate it. So you sit down as in a, a normal seat. But when you lift it, underneath the seat, there's a second smaller seat or bracket. Now, that's called a misericord. And what it does is this. You can sit on it, but look as if you're still standing. And the word misericord, of course, is to do with taking pity on the person who sits there. Um, certainly in the Middle Ages they had longer services and far more of them than we do. We're in here night and, and, uh, and morning for our um, daily and evening offices, uh, morning and evening offices, whereas in the Middle Ages they were here five times a day, and in David's day, indeed, long before this building was built, they used to say their prayers three times a day. But you can, in fact, see two things. One, they are extraordinarily comfortable when you have to stand, as you are, in fact, sitting. And also that medieval canons were the same size as this rather small modern one, and I find them extremely comfortable. And then, of course, there's one other feature to note about these seats as well. In the space underneath the bracket, you've got this absolutely splendid series of, um, of carvings. Um, and also, um, on the stall backs themselves, you can see that there are these small carved heads two of them per bay, there are 56 of them, each of them about the size of a two large thumbnails, as it were, and each of them with a different expression. Some uh, idea of the ingenuity and the sense of humour of the medieval carvers. There are several unusual features about these um, stalls. In the first instance, uniquely to this cathedral, the reigning sovereign is a member of chapter, and her stall, the first person stall, is down on the south side. We don't know why we were given this distinction, but the reigning queen has been here three times, the only monarch, in fact, to have been here and sat in her, her stall. She came in 1955, she came in 1982 to, um, for the Royal Mourley service, and then in 1995 she came to grant St. David's um, city status. The other thing that's unusual is that everything is on the wrong side. Normally, the dean stall is on the south side next to the entrance. In this case, that is the bishop stall. And then on the other side, on the north side, is the stall of the dean and, and presenter. Here again, we're not exactly sure why, but it may go back to the arrangements which obtained here before the, before the Normans came. Now, what are the date of these stalls? That's a question which is frequently asked. And on the south side, there are three bench ends, one of which has got pomegranates carved on it, Another one has the Tudor Rose carved on it, and the third one has got the Prince of Wales of Feathers, Prince of Wales's feathers carved on it. And it has been suggested that this, given that the pomegranate was the heraldic device of Queen Catherine of Aragon, that this uh, combination of symbols in fact commemorates her marriage either to Prince Arthur, Henry VII's elder son, or in fact to Henry VIII, whom she married after Arthur's death. And this dates them either then to the beginning or, in fact, to around the beginning of the first decade of the 16th century, which would be right for the, uh, uh, which fits in with the evidence, rather, of the 
uh, painted stallbacks, one of which has on it the coat of arms of Edward Vaughan, Bishop 1509 to 1522. Now the stalls themselves are gathered, as it were, here underneath the tower. That is because of the rather cramped nature of this site. Normally they would have been to the uh, east of the tower, but here they're immediately beneath the tower. And as your eye moves up and you look at the tower, you can in fact see um, first of all, that the, of the four arches, one of them is semicircular, exactly like the nave arches, and the other three are pointed. Now this is, uh, in common with many uh, towers of this date, this tower fell in 1220. Luckily nobody was killed. It was then rebuilt in the more modern pointed style, leaving the old western arch, which was unwise. The tower was shaken by an earthquake in 1247. Bishop Gower then puts the middle stage of the tower on, and Bishop Bourne comes along and puts the top stage of the tower on, and both of them, in fact, had very heavy bells in the medieval bell frame, which still, in fact, exists in, inside the top stage of the tower. Um, given also that the Puritans made a large hole in the side of the tower to take out the bells, it's not surprising that by the mid-19th century, the tower is in a very bad state indeed. It is a drawing extant which shows a huge crack running down the uh, north face. And it is clear that the problems with the nave, the shifting on the west front and the uh, movement outward of the piers is as much to do with the movement of the tower as in fact with the unsatisfactory foundations. They called in Gilbert Scott, the great Sir Gilbert Scott here in the 1860s, and he managed to restore this tower without taking it down, which is a remarkable achievement given in fact that it weighs 5,000 tons. Um, and he did it with a, a, a system of um, timber shoring and sheer um, muscle power. pilgrimage through the cathedral we've now moved even further east from the choir up into the presbytery and in fact the two are divided from each other by a rather rare wooden parklow screen which has been moved to its present position when the throne was uh, itself moved in the early 16th century but really here we're in the 13th century because um, our guess is that indeed when the main outer walls of the cathedral were finished this, of course, was where the Church of Lent 31 had stood, and that was actually removed um, in order to construct this presbytery sometime in the middle of the 13th century. But they kept on changing their minds. Uh, you can see, in fact, that by the 14th century, they'd actually put niches on the um, north side. And then in the 16th century, it all became academic because they lifted the side walls five feet and put in this present um, splendid camber beam uh, roof which in fact we've just had conserved re recently and found that this roof itself was uh, carved and then painted in the 1860s, but beneath the color scheme there are quite substantial traces of the 16th century roof and not only that, of the original 16th century color scheme, which is in fact green and cream and not red and cream. Now at, at, at ground level you can see that um, uh, here in the presbytery you've got these rather splendid uh, encaustic tiles. Most of them are Victorian. They are copies of the ones put down here in the 16th century. And indeed, uh, it was also thought at one point that where I'm standing now, the tiles had been destroyed by Cromwell's troopers as they came in on that August afternoon to, to do damage to the cathedral. Um, anyway, they were replaced, except for the ones in the presbytery itself. And there we have a rather fine um, surviving uh, tile pavement of the 16th century. Uh, recycled tiles, many of them, from the other parts of the, of the building. But there are two things, major things of interest to the history of the cathedral here in this part of the building. The first, in fact, you can't miss. It's the tomb which is stuck right in the middle, uh, in front of the high altar, right in the middle of the processional way up from the, from the choir. It wasn't here originally, um, for this is the tomb of one who is said to be father and brother to kings. This is Edmund Tudor, half-brother to Henry VI, father of Henry VII. He died at the age of 26 in 1456, which means, of course, he never saw Henry VII, who was a posthumous child, born in 1457, buried, first of all, in the Grey Friars at, at Carmarthen, and then at the dissolution of the monasteries, actually brought here. Now, there's a story to tell there, because at that time, our first Protestant bishop, William Barlow, was convinced really that this was the wrong place to have a cathedral. 
It should be somewhere more anglicized, somewhere less remote, somewhere more urban. And he wanted to shift us into the Church of the Grey Friars at Carmarthen. Uh, he had at that point quarreled with my predecessor, Thomas Lloyd, uh, whom he had accused of being a pirate, which may or may not have been true. But in the event, it was Thomas Lloyd who got his hands on the Grey Friars, founded Carmarthen's first grammar school there, and Edmund Tudor comes this way. And so the story goes, we were able to tell Henry VIII, you cannot close us down because your grandfather's buried here. The bishop moved to Carmarthen, where in fact the bishops still live, but we stayed here. Now, why is Edmund Tudor in that position? I think he's there because he's drawing attention away from something else. And that something else is immediately here to my right. And without this, it's very battered. It may not be, have been reconstructed properly. It fills this um, arcade, and indeed, at one point, from the 1640s to the 1860s, all of the, this part of the cathedral outside these arcades was open to the sky, and they were blocked up. But this piece of, uh, of um, architecture did remain visible, and it is what is left of the Shrine of St. David. Now, on the shrine itself, uh, at the back here, there were, in the niches, there were three mural paintings one of St. David, one of St. Patrick, and one of St. Denis of France. And then over it, and you can still see the marks on the capitals of the piers, there was the, uh, a timber coving exactly like the one which is almost opposite it on the north side of the presbytery, where you have that very fine um, 16th century timber um, sedilia, which also has a timber coving, but this one in fact was, was painted. And that survived until about 1600. But by that time, the relics had been uh, destroyed and the shrine had been slighted. As we continue our pilgrimage eastwards of the building, we're now in the North Choir Isle, and this gives us an opportunity really to see the rather plain back of the shrine of St. David. Uh, a view which the medieval pilgrims would have seen as they made their way up towards the east end of the building and towards the ambulatory. But of course, they wouldn't quite have experienced it in the way that we are now because we have this rather large um, 14th century window here on, on my right. They would have been lit by much smaller, uh, narrower, round-headed windows of which um, a fair proportion uh, remain in the walls, uh, but in the form of blocked outlines and mortar, as we can in fact see on this side here. And indeed, the, um, the steps up into the library, uh, the reason that the door there is four feet off the ground, in fact, is that they utilize the 12th century uh, window reveal to make the doorway and the spiral staircase. And another peculiarity here, as I s said, in the other side of the presbytery, we can see they kept on changing their minds when they came to putting a vaulted uh, ceiling on. They did the same thing here. You can see this uh, vaulting shaft, which is terminated here by this um, small, uh, small cap. And clearly, they never actually um, finished the, uh, the idea, even, of actually putting, putting the vault in. And then behind me, um, if we have Edmund Tudor as father and brother to kings, we also have here um, one of the princes of South Wales. Now, the great king of South Wales, Rhys Ab Tewdwr, who was killed in 1093 fighting the Normans, was in fact a very generous benefactor of this, of this cathedral. And his family, especially that his grandson, um, the Lord Rees, who was buried in the equivalent uh, position on the uh, south side of the, um, uh, of the presbytery, and his son Rees Grieg, who is uh, buried here, plus certain others of their family, actually chose to be buried here in this, in this cathedral. And it is arguable that the growth and development of the cult of David, which ultimately saw him as the patron saint of Wales, is actually attached to the fact that the, this family were patrons of this uh, cathedral, and therefore of its, um, its uh, patron saint. We're now in the ambulatory. That means a covered walkway. It is part of the processional way designed in this cathedral in the 13th century for the circulation of pilgrims. In fact, this is added on to the 12th century cathedral. They cut through the two um, end walls, as it were, to make this um, um, special walkway, leaving a space in the middle, which we'll be looking at uh, shortly, but opening out then from this walkway to the east, 
was and is the Lady Chapel of the Cathedral. Um, this was re-roofed in 1901 um, and then generally refurbished in the 80s of the 20th century when this rather splendid modern uh, metalwork screen by Frank Roper was actually added and um, indeed it, it en en enhances the general um, artistic uh, ambience of the, uh, of the cathedral. And the Lady Chapel, of course, is where the Welsh uh, congregation of this cathedral meets every Sunday. Before we move into the central space, we pause briefly here in the southern arm of the ambulatory, first of all to look at the splendid early English arches uh, out of which we've emerged, but also because uh, this is the last part of the cathedral to be brought back under a single roof in the early part of the uh, 20th century, following the vandalism of the 17th century. And the decorations were chosen and paid for here by the Countess of Maidstone, um, whose effigy lies behind me here. Uh, it's extremely costly alabaster, um, but it's somewhat over-exuberant for the rather austere nature of this, of this building. Having said that, it is only fair that we have material from the 20th century as well as from the 12th, 13th, and the um, uh, 16th century here. Um, and then behind me is the Reredus of the altar. This is dedicated to St. Edward the Confessor. And um, people always ask us why, in fact, first of all, what the writing is on the Reredus, and secondly, um, why? Well, it's in Greek, and it's in Greek because the New Testament was written in Greek, and what we have there is chapter 4, Revelation, and the four living beasts carved on the upper part of the Reredus, and then below, the um, company of martyrs from chapter 7. We've now come into the chapel of the Holy Trinity, which for most of its life was an open courtyard to let light into the great windows uh, above the high altar. Now, of course, you can see, A, that they're blocked when this chapel was built, uh, and indeed, we can see why we haven't unblocked them, because this is a rather fine example of late perpendicular architecture. It's the last phase of British Gothic, and this, uh, with this fan vaulted roof above us, um, tells us, really, its date and its history, because this spot was chosen by Edward Vaughan, who was bishop from 1509 to 1522, whose arms are on the north side of the, of the roof. There's a modern statue of him here behind me. He's buried in, in front of me. He, in fact, chose this as a spot for his uh, Chantry Chapel. Um, but in 1923, it was uh, refurbished to mark the uh, fourth centenary of his death, but also the seventh centenary of the death of the figure, the man, in fact, whose uh, representation is in the other niche, and that is possibly the most famous person linked to this cathedral in the Middle Ages, Geraldus Cambrensis, Geraldus de Barry, author, churchman, and unfortunately failed bishop. He was elected bishop of St. David three times, but was never actually enthroned, partly because of his descent. He was half Norman and half Welsh, and Henry II, having had trouble with one turbulent priest in uh, Thomas of Becket, was not going to repeat the experiment with um, Geraldus. But then, uh, when the chapel was refurbished, the medieval altar stab was recovered, various other carved stones from the building were put together under it, and then this rather fine 14th century altarpiece was placed here, uh, very aptly indeed, as the Reredus for the, for the chapel. And it's a crucifixion scene flanked by four saints. And you can tell who they are because of the symbols they hold. Remember, in the Middle Ages, you had an illiterate population a saint had to be immediately identifiable, and therefore we know that the one on the right is St. Paul because he's carrying the sword with which he was uh, executed. Next to him is St. Peter, carrying the keys of heaven. Next to him is St. Andrew, and this cathedral is dedicated to Andrew and to David. And then next to him, well, anyone who was being a pilgrim here in the Middle Ages would have looked like that because that is St. James, St. Iago de Compostela, the patron saint of pilgrims dressed as a pilgrim. Indeed, our annual chapter meeting takes place either on or within the octave of St. James's Day every year. Now, this feature, of course, wasn't visible um, for most of the existence of this chapel from the 1520s onwards. But when the chapel was restored in the 1860s, this 
niche appeared. They thought there was a doorway here, so they opened it out. And what they found was this remarkable carved cross in the middle there. And it's surrounded by four others, actually. There's one hidden behind the wooden chest. And it's an open-armed cross. You can, in fact, see right through into the main building. And their view at that point was that this had been a niche in which pilgrims could come in, kneel on this sill, and either put their arms through one touch or look at what was on the other side, which they thought to be the arms, uh, the uh, shrine of St. David. The problem was, of course, that certainly it's before 1275 and after 1089, um, the shrine doesn't appear to have been in, in, in existence. And in fact, they then exposed this niche as part of the early uh, history of the, of the building. But they also discovered something even more remarkable. On this stone sill, there were ashlar blocks exactly like these, set on edge to make a sort of box behind which there was a whole mass of bones. And somebody had poured mortar in, so there's one solid block of bone and mortar, and then the whole lot had actually been sealed up and plastered over. The Victorians didn't think much about that in the sense they just took the bones out, put them in a box, and buried them immediately in front of me. In the 1920s, however, the view um, came about that what we had here were the bones of David and Justinian, which had been rescued from the shrine when that was slighted on March the 1st, 1538. Um, and they were, in fact, enshrined afresh in this new um, uh, oak and um, iron box which was made for the uh, for the occasion and the reopening of the chapel in the in the 1920s. Now, many of us were quite suspicious about the um, identification of the bones, partly because there is a extant description in a letter sent by William Barlow to Thomas Cromwell, Henry VIII's uh, chief minister, saying that he had forbidden the chapter to expose the relics of David on the 1st of March, 1538. Uh, we did so and defied him, and he sees the relics. And what they were were two silver head reliquaries, a silver arm reliquary, and what he refers to contemptuously as a worm-eaten book covered with silver plate. Uh, and to me, that's the greatest loss, because that might have been an early copy of the, of the Gospels, like the Lindisfarne Gospels, like the Lichfield Gospels, and, uh, and so on. But anyway, the bones that are here are nothing like uh, what are described in the letter. And the general view is that, in fact, Barlow sees them, sent them on to London, and they were destroyed in the, smile, in the fires of, of Smithfield. But uh, four or five years ago, we decided to um, have the bones carbon dated, and um, there are at least three people in there, one of whom may be female, and they date from the 12th, the 13th, and the 14th centuries. And um, I think the general consensus is that this area was, in fact, um, a rubbish tip for the cathedral. Uh, it cost fourpence to actually clean it out before they could build the, um, build the chapel. And I also suspect that the early cemetery of the cathedral is here, because some of our more remarkable early Christian monuments come from this uh, area of the building. And indeed, um, when they were leveling off the ground for this chapel, they may well have disturbed bones that they put in there and then sealed them up, uh, because that really wasn't part of the, um, of the plan of the, of the chapel for, um, for 1520. On the other hand, the bones have been very carefully preserved. And one does then wonder precisely what was um, uh, what significance they, they really had. Uh, in any case, having done the carbonating, we actually put them back into the chest. That is where they were found, and we now say on the um, label, chest containing medieval bones, long reputed to be those of St. David and St. Justinian. It is possible, we say, that the bones of St. Caradog may be among them. That does not appear to be the case. The shrine of Caradog is in the north transept under the tower. And as far as we know, the bones which Scott discovered in the 1860s are back in St. Caradoc Shrine.